grace and peace to you and God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I've shared with you before about the importance of understanding our own collective histories. When we fail to understand that sense of our collective histories, we tend then to misunderstand and misinterpret. It is especially true when it comes to Scripture. If we don't understand the actual historical context out of which it comes, and if we pluck it out of that context, then there's a tendency to bend it, to make it as a pretext, and to assign it some meaning it was never meant to have. I see this all of the time. But it's not just scripturally, it's cultural. Not remembering our own histories. <coughs> we tend to make statements that simply distort that rich understanding of who we are. I was attending a meeting and there were some people who were speaking. They wanted to be senators. And one of them, a fellow who actually did get elected, wanted to remind us that he was a party, he was a member of the party of Lincoln and of Reagan. I wanted so desperately to say, hey, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. It's an inability to understand our own histories. We had a fellow who, every year in a paper in South Dakota, his children would write these letters about what incredible Christian men the founding fathers were. And they would take certain quotes and around that build this myth. A classic example of taking something out of its context. They would quote Jefferson. They would quote Madison. They would quote Ben Franklin all of whom were deists. Thomas Jefferson wrote his own Bible. He said the miracle stories couldn't possibly have happened, and so he just cut them all out. And yet if you were to read these letters from these children, you'd think, wow, See, it's what happens when we pull that text out of its context. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and we have, in fact, kind of a double whammy here. And a lot of that is attributed to the fact that we don't really understand a monarchy. We don't have one. Way back in the 1700s when there was a discussion about what kind of government we wanted to form, there were some who wanted to go back to what they knew. And what they knew, of course, was a monarchy. Some even approaching George Washington to <coughs> ask if he would perhaps assume the mantle of king. Fortunately, he rejected that. But it's what the world knew. All of our ancestors 
came from lands where monarchies had been a part of their history for thousands of years. They would have understood what a monarchy means. We, however, we don't have that understanding. The understanding that I have is simply what I read. And that's the royal family in England. I have some, some news feeds that I read on a daily basis. And one of them, there isn't a day that doesn't go by that something that one of the royal family does just pop up. <coughs> and there seems to be a, well, some trouble in the royal family, especially with Andrew. Andrew's having a little bit of a tough time. And Andrew, while I don't feel any particular sympathy for him, I understand his predicament. His chances of getting to the throne are not slim. They're none. Because Charles has sons. And now his son has a son. It ain't going to happen. And every time another kid is born, he just gets pushed back another knot. Now, Andrew has always been a bit of a wild card in the royal family. But I have to believe at some level, the queen has to know that she's utterly worthless. I mean, she serves no function other than ceremonial function. She has no power anymore. The days of the King George are gone. And yet somehow they have to justify their enormous cost to the taxpayers in Britain. And the only way they can possibly do that is they have to keep their noses clean. So they really aren't worth anything. For a while I watched the little PBS special they had down in the Abbey. And it's about a royal family in England, but these aren't the upper echelon of the royal family. They're down the food chain a ways. The fellow is an earl, whatever that means. And so they have a little fiefdom. And the queen is coming. And if you've ever watched that, you'll see this differentiation between the upstairs and the downstairs. The upstairs are where the royals live. The downstairs <coughs> where the servants live. And never shall the two ever meet. And so the Earl and his wife are going over some of the rules when it comes to the Queen. You can't touch the Queen. You can make no physical contact with the Queen. That's what sent everybody into an uproar when Michelle and Barack Obama were visiting and they were looking at something and Michelle put her arm around the... And everybody goes... Oh! But she wasn't the only one to get in trouble. Our dear current president got in trouble because standing next to the queen, he did the fupa fupas. He turned his back to her. You can't do that. You can't turn your back to the queen. When the queen walks in, everyone must stand until she is seated, and then you can see. When you eat a meal with the queen, when she's done eating, you're done eating. Even if you still have half your pork chop left, you're done. <laughs> and if you should have to somehow, perhaps, visit the restroom, 
and the queen is sitting to the right at the end of the table, and the exit door is to the side, you must walk out backwards. Now you might think that's silly. I certainly do. But that's our understanding of monarch. So imagine the surprise of the two criminals who are being executed with Christ when they see above him King of the Jews. And yet there he is nailed to a cross like a common thief. You see, kings had all power. They could do anything. If you happen to look wrong at the king, the king could call his henchmen off with your head and then they go merrily on their way. There was no limit to what you could do. There was no limit to the power that you had. Here is a king nailed to a cross. And not just nailed to a cross. He is stripped of all of his clothing. That's a part of the humiliation of crucifixion. Is you are completely naked. That's why they're casting lots for his clothing. And for grueling hour after grueling hour, as you slowly are suffocated to death, because that's what crucifixion is. People who walk by are exposed to everything vile. That's what it's meant to be. And here's where we get so confused. Because we understand earthly monarchies. We understand the power of an earthly monarch. We understand in many ways, if we read the history of the monarchs, even of poor Britain, we see that they're filled with evil, with greed, with murder. And now all of a sudden we have a king. And it's no, no wonder why, you know, the criminals say, if you are in fact the king, get us out of this. Kings could certainly do that. Call a halt to the whole thing. Save yourself and of course us. <clears throat> That's where we get it all wrong. What we see in Christ is a true king. A true servant. If we were to write the downtown, the downtown Abbey story, it wouldn't be the servants who live in the basement and the royal who live on the top floor, it would be reversed. It wouldn't be the servants serving the royalty, it would be the royalty serving the servants. And we see that on every page of the gospel. Jesus continues to remind his followers that we are to serve, we are to place ourselves last. We are to occupy the lowliest of places. Because that's what true servant, leadership, kingship means. The absolute antithesis of what we see in earthly kingdoms. And even his followers didn't get it. 
They really expected Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom. That's what they expected. That he would set himself up as king, run the Romans out of Judea. And he would be in power. Which means his disciples would be in power. Because that's what earthly kingdoms are. But instead, instead of scattering, Jesus' Lordship is about gathering. Rather than using people, His kingship is about valuing people from the highest to the lowest. That's what it means to be king in Christ's kingdom. It means at the very core, as the criminals couldn't quite figure out, that Jesus wasn't there to save himself. He wasn't there to save them. He was there to save all of us. And the only way to do that was to give himself up completely. That's the paradigm. That's the mind. Always placing myself last. Always building up those around me. Always serving the other. That's what it means to be God's king. We're the most celebrated in our midst of the loneliest. A kingdom ruled by love and humility and compassion. Always for the sake of love.